Hello everyone, I'm Vikas. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon based on your location. Today I'll be taking you through some of the enhancements that we have done for model build workflow. It was a short list, so there are a couple of key enhancements that we have done that I'll be showing to you and later on I'll also run through some of the CAD import export enhancements that we have done for 2023.1. So first and foremost is map components to the part. This is a new functionality that is, this is a purpose built tool and it allows you to align the existing legacy decks which have components only and no parts to uh, a part hierarchy with a predefined structure. Uh, it uses currently the shape AI algorithm, the machine learning algorithm we have, and also the traditional bounding box method to accurately predict which comp uh, component belongs to which part and then arranges that part into that particular uh, arranges that component into that particular part you can you can see this functionality under organized menu as map components to parts some of the key benefits of uh, this functionality are it offers quick and efficient resolution for customers dealing with numerous legos legacy models so if your customers uh, have a lot of models that have components only but they would like to map it to the part hierarchy then this tool is handy it also allows users to transition the workflow towards part based paradigm and of course uh, overall legacy data management is optimized and you bring the users into more uh, more in line with uh, modern and efficient cad practices we do have a short demo video uh, that shows this functionality we are using our standard um, standard model for that i do have a legacy model that has components only and if you see the process will run very really quickly and it will align these uh, co components into correct part uh, one thing you will notice when you are importing uh, component only solver decks is uh, you will see that there is a flat list of components in part browser if you are importing that but with this method, you will be able to directly uh, put them into the right hierarchy. One of the prerequisite is you should have a, a bomb hierarchy loaded in the session for this tool to be used. Otherwise, you'll be presented with an error message. Uh, this tool works on uh, first shape AI algorithm. It tries to determine the part and put them correctly into, uh, it tries to determine the shape of the component and then it tries to put it correctly under correct part. And if that method doesn't give the uh, expected results, then we go to traditional bounding box and work on the remaining components that have not been uh, correctly put into the right part and try to associate them. At the end of this uh, this particular process, we do pop up a message. If all the all the components are correctly placed, then process complete message comes. If some of the components are not correctly placed into the right part, then we do pop up a message saying that you know a seven out of eight uh, components have been re uh, correctly placed into the right part, and you need to take action regarding the last part, uh, last component that is still orphan. This being uh, one of the one of the key uh, requests from field for some time, uh, we have managed to do it in a best possible fashion. The next enhancement is ribbon-based representation workflows. So most of us were aware that we already have a lot of ribbon-based workflows. Match is one of those examples, classifies one of those examples. But for the part browser workflows, we are still uh, working through the context menus. Uh, with 2023.1, those part browser workflows are also brought into the ribbon-based paradigm. You will see a new icon under build called reps. Uh, that that icon will actually uh, do most of our most of our uh, actions that you are doing through context menu. So it gives us improved visibility and ease of access. You don't have to be dependent on deeply embedded context menus. It also allows seamless execution of basic to advanced operation. We have we have provided all the operations that you can do through context menus. Of course, uh, advanced options are hidden by default to give user a quick access to frequently used tools without overloading the new users with all the options. So uh, by turning on the advanced option, you can do again all the operations that you could do with the context menus. And this is again an intuitive graphic centric interface. Of course, it works for both browser selection as well as graphic selection. And it aligns with our standard workflow. Again, uh, I do have a short video showing this uh, this announcement. You, as you can see, I don't have anything loaded in session, so I select uh, a part in uh, browser and do 
control A, it selects all the parts and I go with the load from the session. I'm loading the display representation here. Uh, it, it will load in a second. Yep, here it is. Uh, we can select then particular part in the graphic. Again, go to representation. This time we can decide to do uh, uh, create from uh, create a representation core. I'm selecting course by MM again, even though it's available for the demo purpose. Uh, it will launch the batch machine in the back end and uh, it will start the machine. So batch machine was running on the second screen, which I had to bring in into the view for the recording. Now, if you go to the uh, uh, this advanced menu, you will see that we have show all actions option. And if you go and select a part, you will see that these many actions are available. These are advanced menus. We have also exposed the, all the settings, load settings, unload settings, save settings on 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 this particular uh, ribbon so that way you can do all the operations that you are doing uh, through context menu you can actually do through ribbons this is more uh, intuitive uh, less clicks and less um, going into those deeply embedded context menus it really helps with the efficiency and this is one of the key features that we have for 2023.1 other than these two features, we do have uh, assembly ribbon reshuffle, wherein we have we have we are trying to lim uh, limit the icons that are available, so that user doesn't have to go too much into uh, onto the right side to access new icons. Collaborate is uh, is our organized browser. It has been in uh, maintenance mode for some time now. It has been reshuffled and moved to a drop down here in the organized. So. You, if you if you still want to access this, it's still available, but you'll have to go in organize and select collaborate and also the subscribe, which was a satellite icon on collaborate. Then direct access to component assembly and include browser. These these three uh, has been removed from the remote uh, ribbon to promote the best practices workflow. You can still invoke them from model browser via double click, but they will not be available as an icon. So as a result, we have a very uh, simplified ribbon, which is not having too many icons, which uh, doesn't promote the best practices workflow. Going on to the next one, we do have some additional updates that are that are important to everyone. One of them is we have upgraded the shared library version support. Until now, we are supporting the PostgreSQL 13.8 for parts, subsystem, and material library operation. Uh, sorry, it was the 10.1 was supported, and now we are moving to 13.8. Apologies for that. Uh, this is uh, this is a new, uh, newer and almost latest version of PostgreSQL that we are supporting. Uh, the the documentation for uh, installing and configuring this PostgreSQL 13.8 is a bit different dot 10.1, but it is updated and available in our help. Also, the migration related steps are also available. If your customer wants to migrate from 10.1 to 13.8, then that migration steps are also included in the in the documentation. The next one is ease of access to material data. So in in the last release, we, we introduced HMMDC integration via context menus, but that was only exposed in the graphics. Now we have we have brought it out and we have also done uh, we are also supporting it for uh, idle context. So if you select uh, a material and select a part in in your graphics, you can see library load from AMDC, which will which will take you to the AMDC page where you have to log in and download the material. So this is another uh, small but uh, significant enhancement. That that concludes model build uh, related updates. I'll move to CAD import export. I just have one slide for it. We do have done a lot of uh, performance and infrastructure updates for CAD import export. So other than that, those updates, we do have some other updates that I want to bring your attention to. One of them is unified common preference to streamline CAD settings. If customers are dealing with multiple CAD formats, then there was always complaint that we have to go and set uh, most of the settings individually. So taking this feedback in, we are also provided now a, a common preference wherein you can set all the common options in this uh, this one place, which will be then populated to the individual CAD, all of the individual CAD. If you want to have a, a CAD preference for one particular CAD uh, different than the other CAD, then you can of course go and individually set them. But if you want to have a common setting across, then you don't have to actually go and find your CAD and set it. You can do it in the common section. 
and all the CAD will get it. This is, this is a latest NX version that is NX2306 and it is supported only for the native reader. This is a big announcement because NS is, NX is always continuously updating their version and we are trying to uh, support the latest since customers are jumping onto it. So this is what is being used in, in market right now, 2306, and that is supported for the native reader. Uh, there was a request to read the product and manufacturing information from the JT files uh, from the customers. So we have we have supported that as well in 2023.1. So once you import the JT files and if it has the PMI data, it will be shown as metadata. And uh, layer filtering for um, NX uh, third party is also implemented just like native uh, native readers. So. If you if you have used the native readers, you know that we could always filter based on the layers. And now same functionality has been extended to even the third party that is CQ based readers. Uh, with that, I have concluded my part. I'll, I'll hand it over to Sophia. Hi everybody, I'm Sophia and I'll take you through what's new in 23.1 from the browser side. Okay, we have this uh, element categorization now come up in model browser. So here the element folder has been now classified based on the dimensions and their configs. So the dimensions being 0D, 1D, 2D, 3D, and uh, whatever configs belongs to a particular dimension, it's been, it will now show up under that dimension. So let me quickly jump to the product and we'll see how it looks there. So as soon as you load a model or you have an elements folder, you're going to get this small drop down and you hit it, it's going to open up and show you the dimensions, uh, the dimension level. And when you open the dimension level, it's going to give you the configs that are present under that particular dimension. And then upon opening the config, it's going to give you the keywords that a particular config holds. So quickly, I'm going to highlight all the perks that of having this kind of classification in the model browser. So the first one is previously or so far, we only uh, got a holistic count of how many elements are present in our model, but now we are going to have that count classified based on the configs and in the dimension format. So user can quickly re uh, review from the model browser how many 0Ds or 1Ds uh, are present in their model. That is, and again, uh, we, uh, this folder level opening, subfolder level opening is again available, so a user can quickly open uh, a mass config and review it or edit it from here. Next up is I want to highlight the context menus. So any uh, entity that's present in the model browser, we have the options uh, in the context menu available. So that is made available even for the elements and their subfolders today. Say I want to quickly isolate all my 1Ds, I can do that. Or say I want to quickly rev uh, or like isolate all my 3Ds, I can do that or review all my quads and triads in a model. So today that's going to be possible uh, right from the model browser itself. And again, another thing is you can search it here in the search bar and the search bar is also going to give you the uh, results. So I can even search my keywords or say my configs. And I'm going to have this uh, in the search bar also. So say a user doesn't want to have such a detailed um, classification listed in the model browser for some reason, they can always come here to the preference option. And now we have added this preference option. Uh, so this is going to be kept on by default. So it's going to show us the keyword level. That's uh, the level that is under the config. So if a user doesn't want to see the keywords, they can turn it off and uh, all that they'll be left with is the dimensions and the configs. So that is there. Uh, with this being said, uh, this sort of classification is uh, made available in the subsystem browsers and in the include view as well. So if my subsystem has got elements in it, it's now going to show up in this classified format. This is a perk of having such sort of classification in model browser. And now that we have brought this functionality into the model browser, uh, the mask browser is now deprecated um, because uh, this was the kind of missing piece uh, that was uh, blocking us to not remove the mask browser. But now uh, we have more than, uh, we have all the functionalities available in the model browser, like more than what a mask browser does. So uh, we have deprecated it, meaning 
it's no longer available for use to the users. So that's about element categorization and model browser. Moving on to the next one. So this is a quick enhancement that was made uh, in the card editor. A quick recap here is a card editor uh, went in, in in 2023 and it was a replacement to the legacy card edit panel. So basically now we display this new sort of card editor where it's going to have uh, two portions. The top one is going to show you the fields that uh, resemble how it's going to get written out in the solver deck. And in the bottom portion, we are giving the users controlling attributes so uh, they can use it and it's going to reflect in the top portion. Now, one of the controlling attributes is the card image. So this was kind of made not editable in 2023. We're keeping all the performance factors in mind. So after all the enhancements, now it's available and a user can quickly edit the card image right when they are inside the card editor. Switch here and I'm going to show it in the product. So say I am going to do an edit here. So a user gets this and here the card image is now editable. So say I'm changing it to mat 4. It changes and these controlling attributes is what I was talking. So it's going to reflect there. A user is inside the card editor and they can change it directly uh, here. So they can change a card when they are inside the card editor. And the other use cases uh, with this new type of card editor uh, into the product, we have also uh, uh, given the user the ability not only to select a particular entity, or, but also to create them. So when I create it here, it's going to navigate me to the newly created entity. And of course, it's going to give me the default card. So say user doesn't want to have that default uh, for some reason, they can always go here. And now that this card image is made editable, they can edit it right from the card editor. So previously a user was not able to do this. All that they had to go do was go here and use the entity editor to edit the card image. But now when a user simply enters into the card editor, they can pretty much do everything which they were previously able to do inside the entity editor. So that is card image uh, being editable functionality. Next up is uh, a preference option update with the browser and the adult selector sync. So this feature also went in a couple of releases back. And uh, a quick background about this would be that uh, this, as the name suggests, would sync the browser and the idle. So whatever entity, so the user basically had only two options to always have the two-way sync on or to never have them uh, in the product. But uh, we have introduced one-way sync also. So we have updated the preference option, and now it's going to show us these four options in the preference box so that a user would have more degree of freedom while using or navigating in a session. So, so I have some of the browsers open, and by default, the preference option is always going to be set to always. So say I have my browsers open and this is two-way sync. So if I open any browser, it's going to sync my idle to that. And vice versa, if I have the browsers open and if I sorry, if I select any other entity, it's also going to sync it to that. So this is the two-way sync that uh, the product had. But uh, we have introduced this one-way sync. So when I say only on browser switch, the idle is going to respond to whatever browser is made active. So the vice versa is not possible. So if I pick a property here, even though the idle is set active to properties, it's not going to sync with the property browser, though it is up uh, in the entity views. So that is the one way sync. And the other one way sync is the vice versa of this. It's going to switch only on idle selector. I have my property set in the idle selector, and if the browser view is up, it's going to switch it to the respective entity view. And the vice versa again here is not possible. So say I pick materials here, then my idle selector is not going to uh, react to that. So in this way, we are giving users a more degree of freedom to play with the model or to use it whenever these options come handy and necessary. Uh, moving on to the next one is the rename by ID. ID enhancement. So this tool is available in the product and we have made a couple of enhancements here. Say I pick my entity and I want to rename it. So first thing to notice here would be there is no longer this fixed format. So previously when this tool popped up, we gave the users a fix, fixed format that they had to follow in order to rename their ID. But now that's removed. Uh, and uh, 
to start with, it's made uh, it's no longer case sensitive, so my ID doesn't have to be in caps anymore. I can give it like this, and if I hit OK, it's it's going to append my ID to the entity name. And the second thing is, so uh, I can pretty much have any prefix and suffix available now. So say I'm going to give it as load on sport test, and then I'm going to give ID again. So it's going to pick any prefix that you give or same way goes for the suffix. Uh, so that degree of freedom has been given to the users now. Uh, and the next is say I pick multiple entities and then I rename them. So I rename all the entities with the same name, uh, but it's uh, automatically going to append the numbers in ascending order uh, here. So this is like for multiple uh, rename, uh, multiple entity uh, use case where a user wants to rename them all at once. And then uh, the last one is we have now given the users freedom to store whatever strings that they use within a session so that they no longer have to type it every time so they can go here and call it provided they are in the current session and simply use it and rename. it. So that is with the, the rename by I. With that being said, uh, jumping on to some minor enhancements here. So most of them being the enhancements that were done on context menu options. So the first one is the entity default dialog uh, option. So we only gave the entity default context menu option at a single entity level, be it in the entity view or in the model browser when we have the entities on. This has been now been enhanced and now we provide the user the ability to invoke it right from the model browser at subfolder levels or when they have multiple entities selected provided they are of the same keyword. The user can pretty much invoke this dialog right when they are in the model browser uh, that for multiple entities. Obviously, when they invoke the dialog, they can be uh, setting their mandatory fields or give the default value for a particular field that they want or hide the fields that they don't want to see in the in the in that particular entity. All this can be done now right from the model browser. So that is this one and then uh, empty includes. So here uh, we have this empty context option available in the include view, uh, which pretty much posted a dialog and gave us or listed the entities that were empty uh, in, inside that particular include. But it's now updated and when you hit empty, it's not only going to list the entities that are empty in that include, but also give you if there are any empty includes inside the include itself. So it's going to help identify if there are any empty includes and you can quickly delete them in, when you're in the session. That is this. And then uh, we have this parameter context menu update. So previously, as you can see here, it was kind of cluttered up. Uh, now it's uh, more clear, made more clear to the user. So uh, when a user adds uh, a particular an attribute as a column in the browser and they have the parameter thing, they now uh, see all these uh, options listed clear, which is resembling how the entity editor is showing. I'll just go to the product and we can quickly see all these. Okay, so here I have my materials and I can invoke my entity defaults from here. I can set certain fields mandatory, given a default value or hide some. So this is that field, so you can invoke it at this level or say I go to the entity view and I pick multiple entities and we are still going to get this. So the same can be done via here also. So that was the first thing that we did. And then uh, say I go to my includes browser and then if I hit empty, it now not only lists the empty entities inside the model, but also gives you the empty include file that uh, if at all is present in the model. So you can pick it and delete it right from here. So that is that context menu update. And then the parameter context menu is this. So I have my attribute and it has a parameter and I can clearly list, see all the options listed here. Those were the, the highlights that we wanted to show from the browser side, apart from other fixes, uh, apart from other issues that were fixed. So with that, I would be concluding. Thank you so much everybody for your patient listening.